Hello and welcome inside the WOSN studios. Thank you for joining us on Press Row. This is our final Press Row of the school year, and we're joined as always by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz on the end, and I'm Matt Finkel. But we've got spring sports state titles to look forward to and predict. Out of the area teams left, we're on to the regional week. Who's got the best chance to win a state title? Wow, I, I guess I'll take the easy one and go with Defiance Baseball. I mean, I, it, even without their pedigree, when you look at how the draw is, you know, I, I think things have worked out very favorably for them. Uh, so I, I would have to go with them as, as my number one. And of course, I'm always thinking baseball and I'm, I'm forgetting about other teams probably, but I think that's the obvious one. Well, I think that the interesting thing about what Defiance was able to do at the district tournament was they did not get a whole lot of production at the top of the order. It was the right. bottom half of the order that really came through. In fact, in the regional championship victory, the two home runs came from the seven and the nine hitter pair of sophomores. Gage Grundon, who was just brought up a few weeks ago to the varsity team. So they weren't playing their best baseball in beating Bath and Bowling Green. They did what Defiance needs to do, which has got great pitching from Shea Smitty and Abe Smith, and that was enough to get them into the regional tournament where a year ago they did the same thing. They, they did what they needed to do, and they took home the state title. I, I think Defiance certainly is one of the favorites to at least get back to Columbus. I think you look at Division Four, Kaleida and Fort Recovery, that could almost be a, a state semifinal. At yeah. best, it'll be a regional final. Great pitching for Kaleida. I just hope Austin Swift's arm is still connected to his shoulder at this point. <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, Defiance, and one thing about Defiance is you, it, with the performances from Chase Smitty this past week was they were able to branch him out, and they timed it perfectly. Gave him four innings in game one. Day ends there in the district semi. He can come back. He goes six solid innings. Tops out at 91 on the radar gun. First time all year that Shea had even hit the 90s yeah. uh, as far as being in the radar gun. So, you know, and they just, they rolled with it in a huge, in a victory over Bowling Green. Now going forward, I would say, you know, alongside Todd as well, Defiance would be my pick just based on the pedigree of what they have. But also, Kaleida, if Austin Swift's arm stays with it, this kid is Superman right now. Well, you mentioned Shea Smitty and the way they were able to manage his innings. The, the interesting thing was Jack Schaller, who's going to go to Ohio Northern and play baseball next year right. for Bowling Green. They wanted to get Schaller out of the game against Wapkin Edward. He was throwing a no-hitter, so they kept him in. From the fifth inning on, they had guys warming up in the bullpen ready to come in. The game wasn't close. There was no doubt that Bowling Green was going to win, but they didn't take him out because he had the no-hitter going. So he ended up going seven innings against Wapkin. Didn't have any innings left over, or had three innings left over. Right. He would have had three innings left over for Defiance. But because he used up the seven to get the no-hitter, all of a sudden, BG didn't necessarily have their number one guy have as many innings as Smitty did. Smitty able to go to the sixth and then turn over to Abe Smith. And it helped that... Defiance was up big when Smitty came out in the fourth. I mean, if you get the early yep. runs, it really right. sets it up nicely for you. And all those teams that you just mentioned collided with Austin Swift, whose ERA is .14 right now. He struck out 18 in relief in seven innings against Lipsick. And then you've got Jackson Hobbs at Fort Recovery and Chase Smitty for Defiance. The regional semifinal and the regional final are back-to-back -back days. So presumably you're not going to be able to ride those guys from both games. Mm -hmm. So out of those three, do you like one over the other? Well, I, I think it all comes down to that first game. The, the semifinal is so important when you play back-to-back. -back. If you get out to a lead and can manage things, you want to play from ahead. If you're playing from behind, you can't set things up for the next day. So I, I think really it, it's the situation will dictate how good you would feel about somebody's chances. Uh, I'll say this about Kaleida. Uh, they did not play very well in that district final against Lipsick. Uh, they had some bad defense, and uh, Austin Swift bailed them out. But I, I think maybe they got that game out of the way. It seemed like they were pressing a little bit, uh, and maybe they now can just play a little more freely. But that back-to-back -back days makes it tough. You want to get out to that lead, play from ahead on Thursday, and have everything set up for Friday. You know, last year, Matt and I did the Bath Defiance regional semi game from Bowling Green and we saw Bath have to press a little bit to get back into that game and you could tell they were a little bit out of their comfort zone which played to the advantage of Defiance. Now granted that was a year ago but I think when you look at the same thing at this level at the regional level you're one step away from Huntington Park you play from behind you're gonna you might hit that panic button a little bit quicker and it's just natural instinct. That being said you know, the teams that have battle tested that have been there before, the Fort Recoveries of the world, you know, the Kaleidas, you know, they've been there in the past. They've got a great chance now. Even Versailles in Division Three, that's still alive. Also, a team that has been battle tested, you know, with deep tournament runs the last few years. 
you know, those kids, they're, I think they'll be okay when it when it's all said and done. Well, don't forget, in Division Three, you also have Anna back in the regional yes. tournament for the second year in a row. And look, this is a Rocket team led by Luke Albers, who's batting over 500. They have been a team that has found a way to win. A big home run in the sixth inning down at, at Kenton Ridge on Friday night to get to the regional tournament. Yep. Talking softball quickly, look for Crestview in D4. We'll, we'll have their rebroadcast of their regional semifinal against Fairview throughout the week on WOSN. And then Defiance, a big win over Wapakoneta. Wapak won the WBL, won unbeaten in the league, only had one loss all season. Defiance came and upset them in the district final, so a good win for the Lady Bulldogs. Look out for them. And another situation where you've got guys and girls competing at the same time, going, going with a goal towards state. Should be interesting to see how that plays out. All right, so since this is our last one before the summer, what's your favorite or your best local sports story of the year? Well, I, I still think it's, uh, it's Lima Senior's ascension uh, in, in football and basketball. I, I think it, it's a story that can't be denied, and, it, and really because the, the arc of the success carried through from both seasons. And, and the thing that I also liked it, for the basketball guys especially was that it was expected. And I think it always gets downplayed when you're expected to be that good and then you are. People are just kind of, well, they were supposed to be. Well, that's when there's a lot of pressure. So uh, to me, I, I don't know of any story that can come close to that time frame too. It was really from the, the first days of August all the way through to the end of March. and. Lima Senior was uh, the story in my mind. You talk about time frame. Time frame, to me, is the 60-some years of Richard Quartercracks no longer yeah. coaching as the king. 890 wins, forced to abdicate in Kaleida. I think that's going to be one of the things that you look back at 2015-16, you're going to go, yeah, that was the last year Qu Coach Quartercracks was on the bench. That's a good one. I had two. First one was Fort Recovery football. Yeah, from absolutely. You know, going from a doormat of the MAC to a state champion in the MAC, and you know, not just to the you know of being another MAC team that adds to the state title lore in football out of the MAC, but also the four area teams that we had in Columbus in March uh, for the boys high school basketball tournament. You you hit on Lima Senior LCC with their second title in three years, and then of course you have Lincoln View and Jackson Center who played each other in that uh, state semifinal on Friday afternoon. Those to me were the stories because. You know, more so the o underdogs overcoming the obstacles to get to this point in a Fort Recovery. To an extent, a Lincoln View. Jackson Center getting a chance to return. Lima Senior with all the expectations that they had on them, you know, falling just short of a state championship. And LCC capping off their second title in three years after three straight appearances down in Columbus. So we're not even going to talk about Coldwater winning four straight state football titles. That's up there. I just rolled with what I had. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, but Coldwater, along the lines of what I talked about with Lima Senior, it, yeah. you, you do forget about it because it becomes a bit ho-hum. Well, Coldwater won another one. Well, oh, Mary you know, Local played for one. You know, it's a uh, salute to those guys. It's much harder to meet those expectations and, in their case, stay at the top and continue to be champions than it is to initially get there. So, absolutely a salute to Coldwater. Speaking of Coldwater, Mary Local, week three this year, by the way. Oh, that's big, early. Big 50-50. Yeah, that one will be good. Could be recency bias, but and me forgetting a little bit more about football, but the athletes that we had from a basketball standpoint, not just seniors, but throughout the region, I haven't been here too long. We always say that, but I don't, I don't know if it'll be matched for quite some time. So that, that was a lot of fun, and that's my biggest takeaway from the 2015-2016 school year. All right, to the NBA now and a former Ohio high school guard who lit it up in Columbus. <laughs> LeBron James and the Cavaliers, the, the wheels have kind of fallen off these last two games when they were up in Canada. Can they right the ship, and what is wrong? They got lazy. That's what's wrong, in part. Well, I think that this team does get a bit full of itself. And what you, the way you can tell is it, you get a lot of long offensive possessions where nothing seems to be happening, whether the ball is stuck with LeBron or with Kyrie. There's just nothingness going on. They need that. They talk about this a lot, but sometimes they forget it. They need flow. You hear them talk about flow in a game. When it gets in this kind of, they just kind of, okay, we'll shoot 43s. Well, we made 20 last time, you know, last series. Well, now we're only making seven or 10 or 11, whatever it is. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a real concern unless they should happen to lose game five, which is tonight as we speak. I don't think they will, but I just think sometimes when you, 
win 10 games in a row and everything's going great, sometimes you need a little reminder that things can go south. Uh, I, I think really game four, they did find their mojo a little bit. And then at the end, maybe they quote unquote ran out of steam from coming back. But I think they'll be okay in this series. Well, as the old saying goes, you don't have a real series until the visiting team wins a game. True. So still have home court advantage for the Cavaliers. And certainly I was never a fan of David Blatt and kept on pointing out his lack of coaching experience. Well, the fact of the matter is Ty Lu has even less coaching experience than David Blatt ever did. And while the first 10 games, everything was peachy keen, as, as Todd kind of pointed out to, this is the first time Ty Lue has really had to face some adversity, some, face some questions about what he's done as a coach. And maybe that's catching up with the Cavs a little bit, having a, a rookie coach on the bench in the postseason. I'll be very interested to see what adjustments the Cavaliers make and whether or not they can kind of find a way to, to limit the Raptors' effectiveness, particularly inside. You know, as I mentioned, I felt like they've gotten almost too lazy to an extent. And, you know, Kevin Love, yes, he got banged up in both games, stepped on a ref's foot, tweaked his knee. Being on the bench for fourth quarter, here you are in the Eastern Conference Finals. In the last two games, he has not played a minute in the fourth quarter. You know, that's kind of puzzling to me. What's going on here is, you know, and maybe it resorts back to this laziness or maybe it was a sense of entitlement this team had that they thought that they would just be able to waltz, go up, go up north, get the passports checked, play ball, come home, and you know, get ready for June 2nd when the NBA Finals begin. They have got to come out tonight with a sense of urgency. Or as Toronto has shown the last two games, whether it was because they were at home or maybe they you know, got a fire lit under them by Coach Dwayne Casey, this is a different ball club than what they saw the first two games in Cleveland. But here's the thing. If the Cavs do lose this series... It's not going to be remembered because everybody's going to talk about the Thunder upsetting the Warriors. Yep. That is a big deal going on on the West. But here's my problem with the Cavs. And if, if game five is close, I just want to make sure that LeBron is taking the shots in the final moments because I'm not going out with my best guy passing off the ball, which is what he did at the end of game four. I think, well, you, I think I, I did interrupt you, man. I think the key with LeBron is not that he has to take the shots. He has to create the opportunity for him to either get a good shot or get good shots for others. He can't stand out there and dribble around and then try and make something happen. He needs to create like LeBron can and not settle for bad shots and monopolize the ball. I think that's what happens a little bit sometimes. Kyrie tries to get some of his when LeBron isn't in the game or even when he is, and then they get in this little funk. Uh, yeah. They just need to get that flow going. Again. Right. Kyrie's a fantastic scorer, and if he's open, he should right. take the shot. But LeBron, to take one shot, I think it was in the final yeah, well, four minutes. Yeah, well, he was completely uninvolved. Yeah. That yeah. was the thing. Not only just one shot, it's like, well, Where is he you? even passing or yeah. taking part? And, and they can't get in that mode. All right, well, we'll see what happens in Game 5. Let's close with Major League Baseball. There's been some amazing pitching performances throughout this spring so far. If you had one game to win tomorrow, who's you, your starter? Are we going current or are we going overall, like broad scope of baseball history? I, I was going to think well, current. Well, said tomorrow, current. Yeah. so It'd be you tough can't to use the so and yeah. Cy Young is still dead. Yep. So. You can't have Walter Johnson. And Mordecai Brown still has three fingers. <laughs> you know, I, I thought this was a great question, and I, I, I would go with Madison Bumgarner because he's proven he can do it. And the guy is in his prime right now. He's 28 years old. He's proven he's a gamer. If you've got a World Series game or something like that you need to win, you want Mad Bum as your guy, so I'll go with him. My current was Jake Arrieta, the Chicago Cubs, and that was the immediate one who came to mind. You know, right now the hottest pitcher in baseball over the course of the last calendar year and what he's done, 17-0 and or something like that in this stretch. Two no-hitters uh, that he has thrown in the last calendar year as well. The guy has gotten it done in a resurgence of his career uh, in Chicago. I'll go West Coast, but I'll go south of San Francisco and go down to Los Angeles and Clayton Kershaw. Yeah. He was my number two. Similar to Bumgarner, Kershaw can also beat you with the bat and on the yes. base pass as well. Both Kershaw and Bumgarner are athletes, something we don't always necessarily see from pitchers, but certainly Bumgarner, you got to give him a little bit of an edge based on what he's done in the postseason. For whatever reason, Kershaw has struggled in the postseason, but I, I, I love what Clayton Kershaw has been doing, and you look at what his body of work has been the last six, seven years, forget about it. Yeah. All of those are great choices, and I had that thought as well. But just for different sake, to, just to mix it up, I'll say Chris Sale today because he was pretty hard on himself for not starting 10-0. and 0. And, and when you have those yeah. highest standards, which he does, I think his ceiling is only going to continue to rise. So. I figured you were going Syndergaard. Nah, uh, Syndergaard was going Harvey. You can't yeah. pick a Met. No Mets. <laughs> no, no Mets. Although, if you want to go pure entertainment factor, then Cologne. 
Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Give him a bat too. Yeah, but Syndergaard <laughs> is the top and net right now. Wives. And if I'm going with a Met, at the beginning of the season, I might have said Harvey. Right now, it's Syndergaard. So. We'll close on that. Thank you very much for joining us on this week's Press Row. And throughout the season, enjoy your summer off, and we'll be, next, we'll be right back here next fall.